morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and you are listening to Like Talk. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas, and today we're discussing bugs, life experiences, and the dreaded lighting hickey on Light Talk. And I have no idea what a lighting hickey is. And this is David on special assignment in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. What the hell am I doing here? And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the three loving Lumen Brothers. And what's with your audio, man? It sounds like something weird. <laughs> I'm I'm literally sitting in a bedroom on the edge of a bed, right, with my microphone on the night table, the the beach in the background, cars driving by, and uh, it's amazing. I'm just on the air because I'm doing. You sound hot better stuff. on a. You sound better on a phone connection. You know, I probably would. <laughs> All you need now is a Dairy Queen banana split. That's how I start my mornings. Well, that's a non sequitur. <laughs> that's like, what's your favorite restaurant? <laughs> what is your favorite restaurant? <laughs> I make my own food. So listen. But you uh, haven't lit. <laughs> I have not lit. Not like Mr. Billington. As many of you know, we usually record our interviews a couple of weeks early. And we actually recorded our Ken Billington interview yesterday. And I think I could speak for my brothers that saying that that was a mind-blowing show. Well, you know, it, something great about our interviews that I noticed that I don't, I think it's kind of true and I'm not sure why, but I think something about the chemistry or the, or the questions or whatever it is, some kind of elixir, sometimes our guests just sort of reveal a little peek into their soul for us. Yeah. It makes them wonderful interviews. A lot, of, a lot of love and warmth that comes through. Yeah. What I think it is, is that the way we do our show, it's just relaxed. You know, we, we try to have fun and we tell the guests, hey, this is really, listen, you've been, Ken Billington's been interviewed a thousand times. So here's an opportunity just to have fun and not answer questions like, tell us about Chicago, which is a great story, by the way. But if you want to know about the history of Chicago, you, you watch that great interview he did on live design. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that was wonderful. So I think it's nice that we're able to add, add new questions. I think they like talking about things. And it's basically what we do with our guests. So we, we say, what do you want to talk about? We ask them, what do you want to talk about? I guess we're talking about, in retrospect, that interview. But, you know, he, he sort of, you know, he mentioned fourth grade. And I was like, oh, tell us about fourth grade. And, <laughs> and as, he was, as, he was rem as he was recalling it, he was remembering things that he hadn't thought about in probably 50 years. And it was that he was like, wow, I just remembered that. So there was sort of a spontaneity and an authenticity to it. And I think the way we do the show, it's relaxed. It is sort of a feature of the, the quality of what we do. And so glad, so glad that these people are willing to take the time and come on with us for an hour. And speaking of interviews, we got to just mention last week's interview with Zach Bovray was pretty cool yeah. too. Zach is a great guy, and I hope you guys enjoyed that. Everyone who listened to it enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what, that was wonderful as well. He's, he's a really cool guy. And who'd know he played bass as well as he did and actually sat in on Rock of Ages. That is a funny story. So if you haven't heard that interview, listen to last week's show, uh, and, and it's very entertaining. So we've been lucking out with interviews. We haven't had a bad interview yet. Well, you know, they're all on a spectrum, but I think we're going to create, what did we call it? The circle of, le you know, the, the circle of legends, like some of the, the folks who are just like, wow, you know, that they came and talked to us, right? Well, and then yeah. there's, yeah. The circle of legends. Something anyway, like I don't know. <laughs> anyway, let's get on with the, the show. The ring of stars, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, okay. okay, so let's get on with the show. I've got the first question today. Okay, this comes from Jason Scott Parker from another forum. Are we stealing questions off another forum now? It was such a good question. Uh, hell yes, I stole that question. <laughs> but, but Jason needs an answer. He needs a Lumen Brother answer. Go ahead, Steve. You got it. Come on. Uh, let me ask the question first so we know what the hell we're to answer. Those of you that employ external touchscreens and do outdoor gigs, how do you deal with bugs activating your screen? <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny question, but probably true. All the help I can get. I, if a bug knows, knows a better channel, go for it, buddy. My touch screen's a USB for touch and HDMI for display. I've looked through the manufacturer's website, and no specific control software is available. Windows 10 doesn't seem to have a sensitivity setting. <laughs> Any ideas other than a fan blowing directly at the screens? Hmm. All right, now, this is obviously a... Uh, 
Uh, it's a niche question. It, it, well, it's an environmental hazard, and I think we need to bring <laughs> our environmental expert in, which we actually have an environmental expert here at Light Talk Central. Who? His name is Steve Woods. <laughs> <laughs> Steve from the woods. <laughs> you know, I've done a handful of outdoor gigs, but that was a long time ago, and I never programmed. Yeah. So I did them in South Florida, where mosquitoes would actually, you'd see this happen regularly, would actually, swarms of mosquitoes would come down on a little child, pick him up, and pull him out of the audience and fly away with the child. So we had that type of bug problem in South Florida. But I've never had bugs actually activate a screen. So I'm going to punt this right to Steve because he is our outdoor expert. Well, Jason, if you go back to the archives of Light Talk, we have discussed this in the past. And it is the, uh, the pig episode. And if you keep a pig near your lighting console, the bugs will be attracted to the body <laughs> That's right. That's warmth right. of the pig. I, I just want to know, where in the hell are you? Are you like in the Amazon? I mean, what, what size bugs are landing on your screen? I have never had a bug activate my screen before. All right. In Jason's defense, he's probably working in South Florida because... Palmetto bugs. Palmetto bugs. <laughs> For the listeners who don't know, especially in the Faroe Islands, because I don't think you guys have palmetto bugs in the Faroe Islands. What a palmetto bug is a large roach. These roaches are usually about two and a half to three inches long, and they have wings. They actually fly, and they are extremely aggressive. They have been known to go to the battle of death with cats. And, uh, you know, it's very, very, very frightening, these bugs. So uh, he's probably working in South Florida because a palmetto bug that size could easily activate a touchscreen. Did you just say they have a death match between the bug and the cat? Is that what you just said? Yes, that's what he said. When I lived in South Florida, I used to live right next to the Miami River. And so you can imagine how many bugs we had in this house. But I had three cats because two was no match against the palmetto bugs. So I had three cats. They would team up and they would kill the palmetto bugs. And the only insecticide that would work against these things was black death. And this stuff, it had a skull and crossbones on, <laughs> on the label. And it would shoot out a stream of like 12 feet away of acid and it would hit the bug and actually fall apart on its back it would like decompose right in front of you that was the only thing that would kill these bugs or a team of cats so i i employed the team of cats method because i didn't want all this insecticide in my house but yeah the team of cats can kill it i have a question technical technical because we just had the hog four training here at uf and uh, noah um, brought us these, um, you know, the little uh, pens with the little rubber tips that you can use on the touch screens. I don't know what they're called, wands or whatever they're called. So my question is, is the touch screen activated by pressure or heat, Steve? I have no idea. Jason and I <laughs> talked about this. Uh, I had two suggestions for him. One was a tarantula. The <laughs> second was throw a piece of scrim across the uh, touch screen. Oh, and, and but if it's heat, that would block the heat, right? I have if no idea. Touch. This is a brave new world for me. I, again, I've never. Do your homework. You just got to do your homework on the touch screen. <laughs> I want to know if it's heat or pressure. Wow, I don't know if it's it's heat or pressure. pressure. It must be pressure okay. because if I'm using a stylus, then there's no there's no heat involved in a stylus. That's the logic. But on iPhones, I think it is heat. You know, it's so interesting. I think Steve just came up with the answer. It doesn't have to be thick scrim. It could be very, very lightweight. That's almost transparent. Bobinette. Like bobinette. 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 Exactly. Or some sort of uh, nylon stocking or something like that. Something oh, that's, yeah, very, that's a good idea. very thin that you put over your screens. I, I think we should test oh, this. Oh, I have it. Back. I have it. Lambskin. No, I looked it up. So near. Okay. okay. Yeah. So Jason, here, doing here's his homework in class. Here, He's doing his homework here's the class. answer for you. Here's the serious answer. Um, dress up as an orchid man. <laughs> dress orchid up man. as a bug exterminator. And <laughs> over the centuries, they've been terrified to see the the orchid man standing there. They'll all they'll stay away from you. That that so like and it's a the pig. scarecrow concept. It's the scarecrow concept. And there's the title. Or, he could, he, or that means he could dress up as a praying mantis. 
this is a great new product we, for a sponsor. Oh, it's a fake sponsor coming you know, up right there. Instead of having a solar-powered garden gnome, which bugs are not afraid of, I'll tell you that right now, you have a or- little orkin man sitting next to your monitor, and that will scare away the, the bugs. Would the lava light attract the bugs? It would. Att- I'm not talking about a lava light. I think it would attract the bug. You want something that's going to repel the bug, and a little orkin man that's about two feet tall... You know, with a little spray can at the ready. You can see him with the Hudson sprayer of, of like a DDT there. Or you can just like completely engulf your entire tech table area with a fog machine. Just take one of the fog machines from backstage, pour some DDT into it, and just pump away, baby. Just right over the deck tech table. You're going to have no problem with... <laughs> All right, I think we need to move on to the next question. We know that was totally unhelpful for you. But, you know, that happens with the Lumen Brothers sometimes. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Who has the next question, Stan? So Millicent in Hong Kong wants to know, uh, how have your life experiences shaped your artistry? Well, that's a lot to say uh, and answer. A, a lot. And um, I don't know how far back to go. I don't know if I can beat some people. But it started w- uh, with my childhood. It my my uncle was an art teacher, and he had a big three-story house um, in Brooklyn. And just to give an example, so at an early age, this was embedded in my DNA. So in the basement of this house, there was a wood shop, and there was a dark room. And then on the first floor, there was a fantastic high-fidelity sound system and a coffee table that was filled with, with so much reading material on every subject you could imagine. Then in my uncle's studio, he did um, calligraphy. And then he also did botany. So there were plants uh, in the house, outside the house, a huge emphasis on botany. Uh, Then upstairs um, in the attic, which was our play space, we had everything from rock polishers to Lego sets. And And then on the weekends, we were taken to the concert hall, the Carnegie Hall. We were taken to the opera at the Met. We were taken to the ballet at the New York City Ballet. We were taken to Broadway. We were we were exposed to so much culture that it just got into my bones. And then I and then I learned how to be a, a, a potter. So I learned pottery, which was three dimensional. And going to the shows on Broadway, I was like, what is this? All this equipment in the air, making these beautiful pictures on stage. So that is where it started for me at a very very young age. It was like, how could I do anything else? And I really wanted to be a painter. And my mother, bless her heart, rest her soul, would let me paint every room in the house, abs- like Peter Max, really? any way I wanted to. Wow. Yes. So, for example, I became the master of masking tape. Okay. <laughs> I would, I would, I would take, a, and I had no money, so I would take a string and a piece of chalk, and I would use that to create shapes on the walls. Then I would spend days masking it out and then painting it. So every room in the house had a different set of geometries and colors. And actually, she let me start on the ceiling of our terrace outside the apartment building. And everybody in the apartment, look at that, a yellow circle on a green background. So I was, so she just gave me so much freedom wow. to, to do, to explore with no judgment. And when people would say, I can't believe you're letting your kid do this, my mother would say, let him go, let him use his imagination. And then that, uh, it's really sort of amazing what I had in, in that uh, early year. So that's why I'm, a, I'm interested in everything. So I'm not just a theater designer. I have a wide range of interests because of that early life. And then, of course, later on, I got interested in architecture and I got interested in museums. And, and, and there isn't a kind of art that I don't enjoy. And so, Millicent, I mean, I would just say complete openness, curiosity, as Steve and David have said many times, embracing all creative activities. And you don't have to be a master of all of them. Maybe you pick one that you're... I wasn't really talented with like building sets, right, so to speak. But I was really talented at sort of illuminating sets, right, and making compositions. So, you know, have an open mind and and drink up all the stuff you can that, that will shape your artistry. Wow, it sounds like you had a wonderful mother. Um, I did. I really did. That's you guys. You know, I, I, I you know, right now I'm getting emotional. <laughs> I can't handle it. Uh, but that is a beautiful story, Stan. You know, my my parents told me, okay, you want to paint your bedroom? Go for it. So I painted the walls fluorescent green, 
and the yeah. trim and the trim fluorescent orange. <laughs> you 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 got more sophisticated as time went on. It was actually magenta, <laughs> fluorescent magenta. So I was living in the red green theory. <laughs> They were, they I can like, describe it. I did railroad tracks across the ceiling. I did star shapes. I did, you know, diagonals and, and complementary colors and analogous colors. And you know, well, that, that makes stuff. sense. You know, you you are a lighting <laughs> artist and arts. And well, you know, people look at my bedroom. They say this kid is brain damaged. There's something wrong with him. And I used to wake up with headaches. I also had a mirror ball and a lava lamp in my <laughs> and white shag carpeting. But other than that. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, our yeah. next question. Oddly enough, this question comes from Alabama. I I I'm, I don't want <laughs> just just take it for what it was. So John in Alabama writes, "What is a luminaire hickey?" Well, <laughs> to be brief, uh, every time you focus a light, you are you are dancing with danger there. Sometimes <laughs> your arms touch the super hard light, ah, and you yeah. get a burn. So a, uh, a branded arm that says strand on it is a, <laughs> is a lighting hickey. Oh, oh, my God. I did not know that. That is a very interesting. I, didn't, I never heard the term, but I figured it out. You know, it's like that guy at the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. After he holds on to that uh, metal, that coin, and he opens his yeah, hand, yeah, 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 it's got that aisle sort of that Nazi, yeah, that's a don't, luminaire hickey. <laughs> don't you remember how painful that is? You hit a three sixty Q handle. I mean, that's usually what got you, and you got that yep, kind of cigar yep. shaped burn. The, yeah, the banana handles. Yeah, well, usually all the the electricity that was flowing through my body as the uh, short was looking for a ground masked all the pain I got from heat. So I was constantly being masked by pain. <laughs> what we have for you in the background there is the sound of some ducks. <laughs> and the ducks tell us that it's time for our Let's Talk About segment. Now, I am going to pull a curveball on my brothers. Because we don't know I, what's coming. They don't, don't know, know, have no coming. idea what's coming because this is actually a question that was asked by one of my students. And I'm sure that the same question has been asked to my, my wonderful brothers and sister, and also to every educator out there. And that is, what process do you use and what considerations do you consider when choosing the designers for the shows at school? Oh, wow. Oh, that's complicated. I know why you say that, and, I, and this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. Because The decision I, isn't, but the criteria is. The criteria is, and the bottom line to me, I'm just going to say this, and I'm going to let Stan and, and Steve talk, because I'm curious how, what they think about this, but it's whatever is going to benefit that particular student at that time, what the best show is, and what the best team will be, and what the director's like. There are a lot of things that go into consideration. The, the form of the theater, so maybe a student needs more uh, practice working in a thrust, or they need it in a proscenium. Maybe they need a musical. You know, But it is, it is kind of complicated. But the bottom line is, is what is going to benefit that student. So that's how I look at things. Uh, what do you guys think? I agree. I think, I think you've nailed it. For me... Um what I would say to your students is that um, if you look at an undergraduate program, uh, those, those guys and gals are here for four years. Then you have a graduate program on top of that, so you have another set of students who are here for three. I start looking at how the teams are put together so that you don't fall into, well, I know what John's going to do. I know what Mary's going to do. We're best friends. I'm, I'm trying to uh, just mix it up so you're seeing different styles and you're dealing with different personalities. Also, uh, the show. If I've got a student who's done a tragedy, then I'm probably going to throw a comedy at them next, um, or an opera or a dance piece. So I'm giving them material so it allows them to grow as a designer. Also, space. Um, we have five spaces here. So we're moving between space. You know, maybe you're very good at a proscenium. You've done a couple of proscenium shows. I throw you into an arena production or I throw you into a found space. And finally, uh, the challenge of the show. How are you going to handle the challenge? How are you going to grow? What new problems are going to be thrown at you? But I agree with you, David. I think, I think what you've said is pretty, pretty solid. 
Yeah, I agree with uh, both of you guys, but I'll just add a little maybe specificity on my side. Uh, Steve, is, you're all touching on this, but um, strength versus weaknesses. So sometimes, I, if it's, let's say a student needs to build confidence, I might put them uh, into something where they have where they're already strong to sort of flex those muscles. On the other hand, once you've done that, then let's see what you're weak at. Let's see what you haven't done, and let's and let's build muscle in those areas. Um, I do think about the overall needs of the entire production program to a point. Um, in terms of Steve's point about the teams, I try to have a student work, if possible, it's really three years or really five semesters that they're going to design, they don't design in the first, to work with the same person twice or same team twice if they can. I agree with the mix it up point that Steve made, but sometimes once you establish a relationship, and it's good, and you know, and you know how to communicate with each other. The second time you work together, it's almost better and richer, so they get that experience. Um, and I also think about when the students ready to meet the challenge of that production. Sometimes putting them into something they're just that's going to be just a little out of their comfort zone is healthy, but it depends upon who that director is and whether or not they're going, whether or not that team is going to be the correct place for them to push themselves beyond. So there's a lot of pieces. I also let the students tell me what they're interested in, um, but but ultimately it is my decision as to what the assignment is, um, and I try to balance all of those all of those factors. Uh, we also have a, a BFA program and an MFA program, and sometimes the, the BFAs are, we have very high quality BFAs, so if I can get them a main stage show where there's a slot that's possible that, that fits into the overall equation, it's not a simple process, and I tend to procrastinate as long as possible uh, on those decisions when that, because I always have new students coming in and I really don't know what they're capable of until they're here for a semester. So, yep, that's how I do it and it's been working for 20 years so I'm not changing it. You know, Stan, you said something very interesting that just reminded me of the way I've been handling things for 22 years here. And ever since I came out here, I would take the season and I would send it out to all the students with the name of the play, where it's being presented, and who the director is. And I would tell them, you guys tell me your first choice and your second choice, right? That's fair. Because you said, yeah, I, I want to know what plays they are uh, committed to or what they really want to do because it says something about what they believe in. And I must tell you, 90% of the time, I agree with it. And it all works out. Same thing here. We announced our season back in February, and the students ranked uh, the shows they were interested in doing. And by maybe late March, we had made the assignments for the next year. And so we actually are in the design process now for the fall season. I agree with that. I, but they don't always get what they want here. Sometimes I'm going to make that determination. But for the spring, for example, my first years are coming in. They're not going to do a show in the fall. And I got to get a sense of who they are. So I have not, now some student, a student came to me yesterday, in fact, and said, I'm really interested in this spring show. And I said, yeah, that might be a really good one for you. I'll take that under consideration. So that he's put in his bid, but he understands that he might not get it because I have, I have wild cards. I don't know who my, so I don't want to, if I give out the spring now, then what are my first years going to get? Right, and I'm not going to give them till I till I see them in class. I got to see them. I got to see them in in situation before I know who they are and what they're capable of. Sure. Well, first years are usually, and I'm sure it's the case with you guys too. They're assisting in the first semester, right? And usually exactly. they go into a show in that venue. They start designing a show in the same venue, uh, in the in the spring, and it's a venue situation more than anything else because they've already been trained in that venue as an assistant. Uh, that that's usually how I do it, but ninety percent of the time, they're I think they're pretty wise. I think they know. I think they really do. Well, they're artists. They have good instincts. Yeah, they have good instincts. Know. That's cool. But but sometimes their instinct is to do what they what they feel most comfortable with, and that I get worried about because they're in school to do what they're. You know, if you're already good at musical theater. Okay, you do one, but I want to get you doing the opposite of what you are comfortable with so that so you, you grow. For me, the, the criteria is what's going to make them grow without sacrificing the quality or the, you know, throws a wrench into the production, right? I, but I really want them to grow. Yeah, for me, it's an easier, an easier decision. We do an 11-show season. So the first-year students coming in, as David says, are um, assisting. And in the second semester, that group of students... Uh, we, those designers are assigned shows 9, 10, and 11. 
So mm-hmm. I've got a show, you know, show 11, I know what it is, and I know who the designers are going to be based on who's coming in this year. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, yeah. I must say, Stan, most of the time when they do select the shows, they write me a, a paragraph or two, why? And most of them say, you know, I do I do musical theater well, but I really want to do this Chekhov piece. I want to do this new devised piece because I've never nice. done it. So they're really for them. They're really yeah. thinking about their education. Excellent. I know there are exceptions, but for the most part, they get it right. They really That's do. That's good. That's so, right. Interesting. Yeah. I think Steve has our last question. Yeah, this is uh, Debbie in New England, and she says, "How do I clean my psych? It looks a little grubby." Uh, well, simple green. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's that simple. I guess you could use simple green, or you or you could take your psych and go to one of these uh, giant industrial. Yes. Uh, laundry places. Laundromats. That, yeah. Well, I mean, they, they have, you know, machines that are, you know, the size of my office. Uh, I think the thing you have to worry about uh, with a homemade clean my psych thing is uh, your psych is probably flame retardant. And I think what happens if you monkey around with that, you may be damaging uh, the flame proofing of your psych. Those things have to be certified. So I'd be careful about a lot of experimentation. And oddly enough, I was looking into this. When if I take a big psych to an industrial company to have it cleaned and then re-flame retarded, it's almost a wash. Pardon the pun. To uh, <laughs> buy a new psych, it's it's you know it's about the same cost. So I'd, I I'd be careful. Flippant, I was going to flippantly say that just get a new one because they do wear out. But I mean, your best your best source of this information is not me. Your best source is going to Rose Brand. And go to the manufacturer. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, go to the manufacturer. If it's a Garrett's, you go, you you call Garrett's or email them, and they will tell you how to clean your RP screen, your psych, whatever you're using, or the fabric. Maybe it's a scrim. You know, if it's a ro- scrim made by Rose Brand, Steve is absolutely right. Call Rose Brand; they're the nicest people in the world. I want you to know. Uh, pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. Call them. They love hearing from you. They want to know how you're using their products. And they and sometimes you know a new thing comes up like hey someone dropped you know a uh, a bunch of uh, luma suck on my psych you know uh, how do I clean it off well nobody's you know dropped luma suck on psychs before so they just want to know okay let's try this let's try that so the next person who puts some luma suck on a psych can find out how to take it off you br- you bring up a really good point it always surprises me because I occasionally look at the online forums and someone will ask a question on an online forum and there will be like 800 answers and (laughs) most of them are just total BS. And I'm always (laughs) amazed that you don't just pick up the phone and you call ETC or you call Rosebrand or you call Clay Packy. Go to the source as opposed to to uh, somebody kibitzing and saying, well, this is what I did. Uh, no, 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 no. It's your, it's your psych that you're about to destroy. I, I, I don't know. Sometimes my students, they're like afraid to pick up the phone. And, and I tell them the business is about networking, too. So you get to know people at those companies right. and you get on a first name basis and you're building your network while you're educating yourself about the stuff. And they know the answer. You know, what? here's a funny story. So I was doing some uh, pushing some buttons last week and. This, one of the students put the keyboard, you know, the moving keyboard under the front edge of the Geo. And all of a sudden, we didn't realize the console was really misbehaving. Oh, like, no. <laughs> I was ringing up the left. I was ringing up and down the level wheel and the and the work and the, and the, the little gooseneck lamps were going up and down. And, it, and I couldn't get to I, I couldn't change the encoders. It was like, what the hell is happening? And I, I this is something weird with the board. So I went right upstairs. It was a Saturday called ETC, pushed the number for the emergency call back. The guy calls me back. I leave him a message. He calls me back in like six minutes. And I, I, I said, this has got to be something simple it's, or really dumb. And he said, it's F9. <laughs> what? F9. It's F9. When you hold F9 down, you can control the gooseneck lamps. And you're, somehow your, your keyboard is holding down. And I went downstairs. And sure enough, we just pulled the keyboard out. It was wedged under the edge of the console all better it was not a serious problem <laughs> now we could have spent a freaking hour on that right absolutely and people do and we this time we spent six minutes and he was <laughs> and we were both laughing about it so just to re-quote steve go to the source 
And just to follow up what Stan said, you know, Stan used to work at Production Arts, and I'm sure people were calling in all the time about problems with the equipment. And, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. and I would call Production Arts. I was down in Miami ordering equipment all the time, and I'd talk to Steve Terry. And, you know, we just right. had Steve on the show. Uh, he's going to, I think his uh, interview is coming up. But anyway, from that call in 1980, you know, I still know the guy. It's like, hey, <laughs> who we, was it? Who, who was, was it? it? Do we remember? It was Steve. It was Steve. Oh, it was I Steve. I was talking to oh, Steve. Well, yeah, because you're talking to the king of the hill. I man. was talking right. to him because he was like the expert, you know, he in, is. in, in, in right. the control. I think it was a control issue. And, yeah. um, you know, and this is a lifelong uh, relationship that I developed mm -hmm. just because I called him to ask him a question. And um, and so just to back up what Stan says, these are relationships. This is networking. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, even even Ken was talking about it yesterday. Uh, you know, and you guys are going to hear it in a few weeks. Oh, yeah. You have to be proactive. Don't call a buddy and say, well, how do I do this? Right. Stan, Steve, we wouldn't have this crazy show if we didn't call our friends. You called each other up to ask about a technical question. That's how this show started. So mm -hmm. this is how you develop relationships in the theater. And, um, yeah, I, I have nothing else to say. Steve, do you have anything else to say? I thought your student's question was going to be, why is the show still in the air? <laughs> <laughs> why is it? What the I hell are you guys talking have, about? Have we jumped the shark yet? That is the question. No, 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 no. When we interview every legendary lighting person, then we're done. We're done. I've got my, I've got my sights on somebody that we need to get. Something that Ken said yesterday, he said, you know, in 20 years, you guys are going to be interviewing my assistants. That's right. <laughs> we said we will be here. I'll, I'll be 90 years old. <laughs> Hello? Uh, How do you know? <laughs> we'll be holograms. We'll be doing we'll a We'll be hob show. hobbling on our canes and wheelchairs <laughs> saying, light dog. Okay. Well, that Hammond organ solo in the background tells us that once again, You've spent another crazy morning listening to Light Talk. What are you doing with your lives listening to us? Check out our website on lighttalk.org for future guests. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk fun. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. And just remember, if you choose to litigate us, our law firm, the beautiful people at Fleck, <laughs> Flock, Flare, and Glare, and our adorable paralegal Snoot will defend <laughs> us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Whee! Gainesville, <laughs> and deep in the heart of Texas. And be sure to tune in next week when we discuss deadlines, track versus cue only, and zip cord. All that and the new sponsor, Light Talk is broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. And we will see you all next Saturday morning. And I'll be from Chicago next week. So here we go. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Light Talk.